Nights. I believe in reason and common sense. Leith Van Onselen from Macro Business with a treasury of common sense. Common sense never goes out of style. It is that time on a Thursday morning where we catch up with Leith Van Onselen from macrobusiness.com.au. It's a big day in Australia because we get the, wait for it, the intergenerational report. You're having a party today to celebrate? I know. We can hardly wait. Mr. Van Onselen, are you having a party to celebrate the arrival of this uh, intergenerational report? Well, Luke, I've actually been partying for about a week because um, <laughs> it's got to be the most, uh, the most, um, you know, worst kept secret out there. Basically, uh, I, I haven't had a, I haven't received a copy of it, but pretty much all the media, all the mainstream media, has received a copy, an advanced copy, and they've been writing about it for a week. So we pretty much know what's in there already. Yeah. Um, but later today, it'll be that you'll actually be able to re- read the report. It'll actually be released to the public. So I haven't actually read the report. I've just read all the articles about the report, and I've got all the you know the, the key data around population growth, which is pretty much stuff that I'm interested in anyway. Yeah, there's, there's been plenty of reporting around it. Look, I, I think, and you make the point writing uh, for News Corp today that uh, the original report released by Peter Costello, now the chairman of this uh, of this company that owns this station and the nine papers and of course nine television when they when they released it back in in 2001 or thereabouts and the population was just a little under 20 million the forecast was that we'd get to 25 and a half or 25.7 million as you write by 2050 2050 and it's 2023 and we if we haven't uh, gone past that number we're just about on it aren't we yeah, that's right, mate. So 2050 was supposed to be uh, be uh, was it 20 25.6 million, I think it was, and we actually hit that number in two, 2021. So we got there 29 years early, and the reason why we got there 29 years early was that the uh, the original intergenerational report in 2001 um, forecast that we'd have 90,000 a year net overseas migration, and that was their sort of steady state level, and uh, a year later, after that report in 2002. The Howard government did a, did a um, an inquiry into Australia's skills, and all the big players like the Business Council of Australia, Australian Industry Group, uh, Australian Chamber of Commerce, etc., they all basically said at this inquiry that Australia's got a massive skills shortage, and that unless we do something about it, I import a whole bunch of people from overseas, we're going to go backwards, and the economy is going to suffer. So, starting from that year or the next year the howard government then started ramping up the immigration program and basically every government after that's done the same thing and the net result is that since the turn of the century or since the 2001 uh intergenerational report we've, we've imported nearly seven million people and since the turn of the century over seven million people and uh basically it hasn't solved the skills shortage so what it's meant is that the population's you know obviously ballooned we've got all the problems we've seen in sydney and melbourne with housing affordability infrastructure all the stuff i always talk about and um, so that basically set us on this whole big Australia process. And ever since then, these intergenerational reports have just keep ramping the immigration you know, numbers higher and also the population growth higher. And this latest intergenerational report um, predicts that Australia's population is going to hit 40 and a half million uh, in 40 years. Oh. So it's going to grow by 14, 14.2 million from what it is now. Now, just to put that into perspective, that volume of growth is like adding another Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane and Adelaide to Australia's current population in just 40 years, which is absolutely insane. Now, I'll put this um, I'll put this to the listeners. Yep. Do they think Australia has coped well with the 7.4 million population increase this century? <laughs> I think pretty much everyone will say no, for all those reasons I said before. We haven't built enough homes, we've got congested roads yep. uh, and public transport, shortages of schools, hospitals, you name it. So how do, how do they think we're going to cope when we basically repeat that twice over again over the next yep. 40 years? Yeah, it's going to be an absolute unmitigated disaster. It took Australia uh, 216 years to, to get to its first 20 million, and under the IGR, we're going to do more than that again in less than 60 years. Wow, it's just nuts. It's nuts. Um, and there's a couple of things just to note from all of that, which is, uh, firstly, we had a jobs and skills summit, didn't we, last year? And of course, the you know the predictable cries of we've got to get people here. We've got this massive skill shortage. So it's happened before, as you so well point out, back in the early 2000s, and we saw what happened as a result of that. We've done it again. Business lobby. I don't know what purpose they serve other than uh, to feather their own nest, and, and that might be, you know, 
captain, obvious me, but nonetheless, uh, they they say we've got a shortage of housing. All right, so we're going to build houses. We'll build 1.2 houses, 1.2 million houses in five years. And that's not a long way from what we did before the pandemic anyway. But they talk about building houses. They don't talk about the infrastructure growth, do they? No, of course not. Well, I mean, let, let, let's be real. We've got, we've got Buckley's and none chance of actually building that 1.2 million houses. Basically, what the... Well, the, what the federal government said is they're not going to build it. Um, they're, you know, the, the Albanese government's uh, Housing Australia Future Fund is only 2.5% of that number. Mm. It's, it's, it's infinitesimal. Uh, what, they, what they've said is, oh, we can just relax those planning and the private sector is going to magically build it. Well, they, they won't because it's not in their interest to flood the market with supply because that just lowers prices, et cetera. So they won't do that. But also, you know, where, where's the... Uh, Where's the materials, land, and everything else going to come from? We've Workers. just seen a whole bunch of builders go bust. It's just impossible. But as you said, what about all the infrastructure? I mean, you can build the houses, but where are you going to get all the workers to then build all the infrastructure to go with all the schools, all the hospitals? If we're going to be adding that Canberra a year, yeah. you need to add all the Canberra's worth of stuff. And there's a bigger issue, Luke. There's also, um, as you, you know, you live in Sydney, you remember this. Four years ago, we were in the middle of a really nasty drought, and Sydney's water supplies are down to about 20%. Yes. Now, What's going to happen when we add, you know, according to the IGR, 14.2 million people and, you know, future droughts roll around? How are we going to, you know, nourish everyone with water? Well, the solution then will be to build wall-to-wall desalination plants everywhere, which are obviously incredibly expensive. We'll have to pipe them uphill to Western Sydney and places like that. And they're also environmentally destructive. They use a hell of a lot of power. All the brine, so all the salt water gets pumped back in the ocean. Um and then that raises the next issue. Well, that's going to use a whole bunch of power. Uh, what about net zero? The Albanese government's committed to achieving net zero by 2050. How are we going to somehow magically reduce our carbon emissions to zero with a population increase of 54%? Yeah. Um, that alone is going to require 5.5 million homes at least, as well as all the infrastructure, obviously desalination plants. The built environment alone, so just buildings and building those buildings and infrastructure accounts for about a quarter of our carbon emissions. So... The whole thing is just does not add up. Uh, you can't have net zero, affordable housing, higher living standards, et cetera, et cetera, and enough yeah. infrastructure when, you, when you're when you growing the population like a science experiment. It's just not possible. How do we... Uh, productivity has been the issue that's been talked about through much of this week, and obviously the Treasurer will have more to say about this today. How do we fix the productivity issue in Australia? I know it's a big question and we haven't got a lot of time, but... Uh, is are there a couple of obvious things that we need to do better? Yeah, like I think I think tax reform is a big one. I mean, the the Henry tax reform process happened, you know, under the Rudd government. There was a lot of good suggestions there. We've also got a whole productivity commission. We've got a whole government agency which is which is there to basically uh, you know answer that question. And the government never follows through on any of the recommendations. So you know, the, 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 there are things that we can do, but unfortunately, the governments don't want to do it. They just want to grow the population the lazy uh, the grow the, the economy the lazy way. Mm. just by flooding the place with people. And, of course, the federal government does that because it's good for the federal budget because it raises income taxes, but then it pushes the costs onto the states, onto us private citizens, et cetera, which I've talked about, you know, uh, ad nauseum previously. So, unfortunately, our policymakers don't want to do the hard yards. They want to do the easy thing. The easy thing is just to bring in a whole bunch of people and obviously bring in a whole bunch of voters for their party. Obviously, obviously. That's a very good point you make. And, and, and productivity means what? In terms of our society, what would something look like that was an improvement to productivity? Well, basically, productivity means high living standards. And the reason why it means high living standards is basically you do the same amount of work, but you get more out of your work. So you basically get more bang for your buck. Um, so, so it could be, you know, anything. So, so for example, if you can work five hours a day and do the same amount of output as working eight hours a day, well, you save three hours and you've got a higher quality of life. You can earn the same right. amount of income for doing three hours less. That's right. effectively what it is. It's just basically doing everything better and more yep, efficiently. Gotcha. Tell me quickly about uh, the gas price in the West. Now, we've talked about this for a long time as well. They've got gas reservation there. So, in other words, the government says to the people that extract gas, look, you're welcome to do that and sell it overseas, but the mugs on the mainland, it's their gas. Make sure they get plenty of it and they get it cheaply. Uh, this was, I think, 20 years ago by Western Australian government. Brave. No one else has done it on, in, in the country. The prices are cheaper in the West than they are in the east. But we, we've got a 10-year anniversary to mention here, don't we? Yeah, we do. So basically, uh, yeah, ten, ten, 10 years ago, the uh, the Grattan Institute, the esteemed think tank, which I don't really have much time for, I must admit, was uh, was busy lobbying the Western Australian government 
to get rid of their gas reservation, the Rodent Articles in the West Australian, saying it was inefficient, it was an unfair uh, subsidy to households and industry, and that it will ultimately lead to higher prices because it's going to lead to less investment. Now, that obviously aged like milk. Um, <laughs> Western Australians now got the lowest gas price of the world, lowest electricity price of the world. Us on the East Coast who followed Grattan's prescription and didn't reserve, reserve our gas are paying world prices. We're getting absolutely reamed to seeing electricity prices and gas prices go up by about 20 Five percent uh, and twenty-five percent last year as well. Um, the reason why this has come up is that the Premier Roger Cook, the WA Premier, has uh, fronted a parliamentary inquiry uh, into their gas reservation. He basically said that WA's gas belongs to Western Australians and the domestic market, and that domestic users should be looked after first before exporters, which is fantastic. I mean, if only we had that on the east coast, we wouldn't be suffering this energy price shock uh, mm. that we're all mm. suffering. Lee's Van Onsel, and make sure you check out macrobusiness.com.au and you can see Leith's piece about the intergenerational report uh, in News Corp today. Good on you, mate. Have a great day. Good to chat. Yeah, no worries, Luke. Anytime.